Um, I'm really grateful for the chance to both be involved in this wonderful project and also to have uh, the opportunity to share the results with all of you. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm just going to position this so they didn't realize that some of us might be so short we can't actually see the screen <laughs> over the podium, but there we go. So, you know, we're going to talk about a few things today, and um, I'm here more directly to talk about uh, our experience and our pilot project with assisted PD, and of course I'm going to do that. I'm going to take you through exactly what we found. But um, the second goal that I have here, and the second thing I hope that some people take with them, is how you really contextualize um, some of the things that we're finding in, in our PD uh, projects uh, and how you can develop that uh, with, with things you're doing in the future. So in other words, you're gonna, we're going to talk about some of the specific challenges when you're evaluating a project in something like a PD population, uh, and hopefully some of those tools might be useful for, you, for people in the future. Um, in terms of disclosures, the only thing I have to say is yes, you know, I, I do uh, I work with the renal agency. I'm paid a salary for some of these things. Um, it's not at all related to how the project does, so I don't get paid more if this project does better, so I have no direct financial incentive to fudge my numbers or lie. Uh, hopefully you'll believe that. Um, in terms of acknowledgements, you know, I, I have many, many people to, to, that were involved in this project that I think really uh, deserve uh, talking about. So first of all, actually, is, is the PD patients and, and the, the PD units themselves, because they really are the ones who push the hardest for, for a program such as this. And, and I think it's worth acknowledging. The units put a tremendous amount of work to, into this. And the amount of work that went into developing, running, standardizing, and then evaluating this pilot was just immense. I'm sure I've forgotten names. I know I already can see I forgot Donna Murphy Burke on there. I know I've forgotten many names, but a huge amount of work went into this. So, so thanks to everyone. Okay, so let's, let's jump into it. And you know, I, I really couldn't ask for better lead-in talks to this because I think I don't even have to say much about why this is, uh, why this is needed after the first things that we've heard already this morning. I, I want to kind of frame this in a little bit of, of even a further way in that, you know, being here, I think obviously we're all believers in independent dialysis and the benefits that come along with that. Um, I, I think we all also recognize that there's a lot of work that goes into to performing independent dialysis. You know, frankly, it's not just a patient who's in, involved, it's the whole household or the whole family. Anytime I meet someone who's doing it truly by themselves, I'm really impressed. I don't know if I'd be able to do that, right? So it's a huge amount of work that goes into independent uh, peritoneal dialysis. And when you think about it, a lot of the benefits that we all believe in for independent dialysis actually are, are probably the most important for some of the people who are least able to do independent dialysis. So if you think about the people who are going to struggle the most with independent dialysis, it's your frailer population, people with extensive comorbidities, with limited mobility. Um, those are really the people who would be best served by being independent, not having to come back and forward to the hospital, being able to stay in their home environment and be supported there. So it's this cruel irony that the people who really should be independent are the least able to be independent. So supporting people to do that, those people who are struggling, really is the epitome of, of patient-centered care. And it's equitable as well. You know, a lot of our other modalities, hemodialysis patients have access to, to things that, you know, respite runs, our home dialysis patient can come in center if need be. They have that type of support, but our PD patients currently don't really have anything. So I, I really believe that this is, this is truly a, a patient-centered uh, um, program. So um, I won't go into all the details about everyone else who's done assisted PD. Um, suffice it to say, we're not the first people to take a, a crack at this. Uh, there are places in Europe that have decades now of experience with this. In Canada, we look to Ontario that has a lot of experience with assisted PD. And I want to say a few things. There's, there's varying level of supports that can be offered to people. You'll see when, what we started with is a kind of a smaller, manageable amount of support that may be built up in the future. But, you know, we can go from a small level of support right up to places like France where if you want to do four manual exchanges a day, they'll have someone come in and do it. So all kinds of different levels of support. But at the end of the day, there's some common themes. The first is that everyone finds a way to support their PD patients. So anyone who's got an assisted PD program, if it looks different, it doesn't matter. They found a way that it works. There's more than one way to skin a cat here. The second thing is that everything comes at an increased cost. If you're going to have increased services, of course there's going to be a cost that's associated with it. And the last point that, that well, I'll come back to later on is that the outcomes are always a little bit variable and that's because I think that all of these people, all of these programs have run into some of the same challenges that we ran into when we're evaluating this and hopefully the way we frame this, uh, y you'll see why that is. So um, some details about our project. Um, so we ran a 12-month pilot and, and, and what we did is we kind of came, uh, came up with 
trying to identify the population that we were talking about. And this was mainly driven by the PD units. And kind of anecdotally, I mean, everyone who works in a PD unit knows uh, people have a general feel for who's struggling and who's at risk of, of, of technique failure from, for their self-care PD. And because of the type of support that we're going to institute, which I'll talk about in a moment, we very specifically wanted to focus on people who are, these are all cycler patients, and we want to focus on people who are having trouble with that act of setting up and dismantling the cycler, uh, or if it's a person, a uh, caregiver, a loved one or whatnot who's doing it, people who are having a lot of burden from doing that. Um, and so we were able to come up with some standardized criteria that people can then go through and see if someone was eligible for this, and then enroll them. And you'll see when we evaluate this, we had kind of two different classes of enrollment. So we had uh, either long-term, meaning we think that they would need this for as long as they're gonna be on PD, or we had what we called a respite enrollment, meaning that they had some temporary interruption to their ability to perform PD that we think would be reversible, and then they'd go back to doing it by themselves later on. Um, so these are the criteria we had, and then in our, our four sites were the sites mainly around the Lower Mainland for ease of, of running this pilot. Um, so in terms of the service we provided, and again, this is different from what other people have, uh, have done, uh, we just used a once daily visit by a trained caregiver to assess with uh, sitting up, setting up the machine and dismantling the machine. And there's a few key things there. So it's a trained caregiver. It's, it wasn't a nurse or anything. We went off the uh, idea that, you know, if we can train family members to do it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a healthcare worker. So the, the uh, external um, um, contractor that we used, these weren't RNs or, or LPNs. They were caregivers that did this. Um, and they, it was a once daily visit. So the patients actually had to do everything else by themselves. So th they had to do all the troubleshooting, all the choosing of dialysate. I didn't write it here, but another key one is they had to do all their connections. So they had to do their connection and disconnection. Um, it was really just setting up that machine. So very limited actually scope of care. And again, we did that so that it would be uh, a feasible starting point that perhaps we can build on in the future. And the patients took care of the rest. Um, so what are the types of patients we're talking about? I stole this slide directly from Sunit for a different talk that we, um, that we uh, made for this uh, program. And, uh, you know, you can have someone like the first instance where you have a young person who's otherwise, you know, independent and actually was struggling to get that independence, um, who has a very temporary, a very, very acute incident happen, breaks their leg and can no longer set up their machine. Or you have an elderly patient who's, you know, has some already struggling with some issues, is already relying on a caregiver uh, to help do a lot of the PD. Now, you know, historically, definitely the first person either would have just stuck around and languished in a hospital for a little while or would have been transitioned to hemodialysis. And you can see the same thing in the second person. And actually, it highlights a couple of key points. You know, we have someone who's already struggling who wouldn't have been able to do PD by themselves, but because they have someone like a husband to do it, they're maintained on PD. And if you think about it, it's kind of an equity problem if we have a very, very similar patient who doesn't have that, uh, that other family caregiver. Uh, now all of a sudden we have to say to them, well, maybe you can't do PD and you have to do, to, you have to do hemodialysis instead. And that's, tr that's traditionally what happened. So these are the type of people and the type of the problems that we were trying to address. So let's, let's launch right into it. So what did we find with our 12-month pilot project? So first I'll talk about the respite or the temporary because it's a little bit more of a straightforward thing. So here I just have in a big table, oh, it, it presents okay, you know, the usages that we had. So we had 13 people who used this, this, this program. And you can see the types of things that they used it for. There's a lot of MSK types of injuries in there where they're otherwise, you know, cognitively intact. They're otherwise medically able to keep doing PD, but they just wouldn't be able to set it up. Um, we have one, and this is the, one at the top is actually a great example of someone who has a family caregiver, but um, that, that's their son who travels on business frequently, and whenever he's out of town, then he needs someone to do the PD. Otherwise, that poor person would end up in the hospital or something. So, um, you know, that's a good example of that use. And, and I want to hi highlight a few things here. So out of all these, these usages of our, of our temporary program, only one transferred to, to hemodialysis. That's that one with the neurologic issues, which frankly was transferring regardless. This was, this was a Hail Mary that, that wouldn't have worked. Um, there was one um, death on PD that went, you know, went to hospice. And this was actually the entirely um, desired outcome, using this as a bridge to get end of life care and pla uh, planning in place to get this person to a hospice. That's actually, you know, that's a very, very good usage of this program. And then everybody else went back to do PD. They were not stuck in the hospital for long periods of time, whereas, you know, historically they would have been uh, s s parked somewhere uh, in the hospital, uh, and they went back to doing their PD completely independently. So th this is very, very good uh, outcomes for this uh, respite. And then, as I was saying, everything comes at a cost. So what's the cost of, of doing this? 
Oh, my screen just blanked out. Okay, oh yes, what's the cost of doing this? So, you know, the median usage for this was 29 days before the person was able to go back to, to, to doing dialysis themselves. And for that entire duration, it cost $1,250 to, uh, to, to do assisted PD for them. That is frankly less than one day in, in hospital. If you could discharge someone a day earlier, it already pays for itself. It's, it's not even close to, to being equivalent. And then you can see the, the other, the blue line in the middle uh, is for transfer to hemodialysis that doesn't include at all actually a lot of the costs associated with access and things like that that happen when you're transferring someone. And of course the impact of someone's life of transferring to hemodialysis. So this is very, very cost effective. So the summary of the respite-assisted uh, PD is, frankly, this is a slam dunk. I mean, this is, this is a very, very easy thing to evaluate. It's patient-centered. We're able to keep people at home instead of in the hospital. They are able then to go back to doing their PD eventually, and it's immensely cost-effective. So this is very, very, uh, this, is, this is an easy evaluation. Let's go on, though, to the, the long-term PD uh, assist program. And here's where I'll talk about some of these uh, more uh, subtle nuances. So, um, just to get an idea of the scope of this, uh, we enrolled for it less than the entire year duration for, for various reasons, but it was less than a year. Um, and again, we had very standardized criteria for who we would use uh, and who we would take in. And at the end of the day, we had 53 people who we brought into the program. Um, as we're going on to evaluate, we established uh, several different comparator groups because we wanted to have some idea of, you know, what, what are we... Um, how our PD patients are doing compared to something else. So we talked about a few things, and I'll show these on the next slides. We have just kind of our general cycler peritoneal dialysis cohort, so you get an idea of how things are going in BC in general. And then we came up with what we called a comparable PD eligible cohort. Now, now what this is, is again, we had this standardized eligibility survey, and we sent it out broadly. And it, this was initially intended to be for people who would otherwise have been completely eligible, but were outside of the service area, because uh, we only did it in the four sites so that we could have you know, a little bit of a better idea. But as we went through and evaluated, it wasn't entirely as clear cut as that. And there were also included some people in here who uh, would have been offered PD assist, but turned it down, which kind of tells you that perhaps they had some other support that they didn't need this, this project. We've, we also actually even had a third group. We came up with a propensity matched group based on some things like comorbidities. I didn't include that because it was so um, similar to the PD eligible cohort that for ease of the slides, I just wanted to have uh, you know, fewer numbers up there. So um, just to get a flavor of, of who the patients are, you can see that the PD assist, which is green, and the PD assist eligible, which is blue, um, are, are very similar in terms of a lot of their baseline characteristics. They're similar in age. They're similar in gender composition, or actually, no, that was the one thing they're different in. But they're similar in age, they're similar in dialysis vintage. Both of them tended to be longer on dialysis than our general uh, PD population. And they had more comorbidities. They had more diabetes, more cardiovascular disease than our general uh, you know, prevalent cycler population. Completely expected, because we were trying to identify who we thought were kind of our, our high risk of, of failure type of patients. So how do they do? So this is always kind of the big ticket item when everyone, anyone's looking at assisted PD is their technique survival. And we censor for death and transplant, mainly in, the, in, the, uh, in those other groups, just to talk about how we're supporting people in the therapy. And you can see a couple of things. The first, I actually, the first I should mention is there is no statistical difference between any of these groups at any of these timelines. So these are, anything you see here are just trends. There's no difference. They're all actually equivalent. Um, in the PD assist group, you can see that, um, and that's the one on the, on the far uh, left, that there was quite a drop down in the one month survival and then it kind of hovered around similar to the other ones. And this kind of makes sense and it's what we saw reported anecdotally is, and y if you think about it, when you're instituting the service into someone's home uh, to do their dialysis for them, there are some people who just right away, this isn't gonna work. You know, the, the caregivers come to their home, they say this, and the patient says, this is not working for me, this isn't what I want. Thanks, but no thanks. Uh, you know, either I'll go back to doing it myself or I'll look at a different alternative. So there's a, 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 you know, a quick drop off and then it kind of holds. And it ends up being actually very comparable, both to the PD eligible group and to the benchmark or a general cycler population. We'll go through all of these outcomes then we'll kind of contextualize them in, in a few minutes. So what happened to these patients as they dropped off? So in blue I have highlighted, we had nine out of our 53 patients over the one year of this evaluation period uh, pass away. So we had nine deaths on this. Again, I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Um, and the, all those people in orange are the ones who transferred to hemodialysis. Again, remember that historically, uh, many, many of these patients would have transferred, but those are the ones that we saw within the pilot who transferred to dialysis. And then those couple of other um, 
are various things like they didn't really like the way the service uh, was working out, kind of some of those early dropouts I mentioned, um, but they stayed on PD anyway, so they found a way. So this is where they went after they, did, uh, after they uh, exited PD. I'll come back to this in, in, in a few moments. I just want to put some of the other hard numbers out there. So a few of the other outcomes that we looked at, we looked at peritonitis, um, and you can see that in our PD eligible group, we had a fairly high rate, actually higher than our, our, our BC average, which again makes sense. We're kind of identifying who we think are our at-risk patients. They probably also have more risk factors for developing peritonitis. But our PD assist group, that they did, we didn't see that increased rate of, 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 of uh, peritonitis. It's very comparable to our benchmark, in fact, a little bit lower. The last number that I want to talk about is hospitalization. We tracked how often the patients uh, ended up in the hospital, and there was a, a much higher rate of hospitalization in the PD assist group. Um, there were some differences in the way that hospitalizations were tracked between PD assist and the other groups. So since we were paying someone, frankly, to come and do their, their PD, we knew when they were in hospital, as, as in we knew that they were not home getting this service. Uh, whereas tracking hospitalizations for the other two group, there is some, probably some errors in that data. But even when you account for that, and, and which we did, there was still a substantial uh, difference in that the PD assist patients were more likely to be hospitalized. And then the last thing I want to talk about before we start putting it all into perspective is uh, the qualitative feedback. So a big part of, of this uh, project, we gathered just reams and reams of qualitative feedback. And uh, I can say that the vast majority of it was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, you know, a common theme uh, that we got from patients, and I gave one example of a patient quote, a common theme that we got is this, that they, they, they don't think they would be able to stay independent. They don't think they would be at home doing their dialysis if it wasn't for this project. They think that they would either be in nursing home or, or on, on hemodialysis. Um, and then the second quote is representative of the feedback we got from the units that really saw a tangible difference in, in the patients coming back to them where they, they saw people who used to be very burned out and you could tell were struggling with their treatment who now were, were, were managing. Okay, so you know those are the f actual numbers, and those are the f that, those are the actual uh, that's the data we collected. But now I think we need to take some time to put it all into perspective, um, and this is something that we need to do actually with any type of program um, that we're talking about, kind of a PD, a frailer uh, population who you don't expect great outcomes in. So let's talk about uh, about what about how we put this into perspective. So, you know, I actually want to tell a little story before we do that. So this, this gentleman who's pictured here is, is Abraham Wald, and, and what this is, is this comes out of the Second World War, and the British Air Force, the Royal Air Force, had a problem where many of their planes were being shot down. This is a problem when you're in a war. Um, and they wanted to, to reinforce their planes, but the issue is you can only put so much steel on a plane before it's incapable of flight. So you have to figure out where you're going to put those reinforcements. So what they did is they gathered up all the planes that they had at the, at the Air Force base there, and they put those little red dots wherever they saw damage on the airplanes. And they said, okay, this clearly is where we have to reinforce. So they put steel on all those red areas, and they sent the planes up, and they were being shot down at exactly the same rate. So they scratched their head a little bit, and it wasn't until they inv invited a mathematician, this gentleman, Abraham Wall, who walked in, looked at these pictures for about a minute or so, and said, well, Obviously, you should be putting all of the steel on the places that have no red marks on them. And so there were a lot of puzzled looks around the room, kind of similar to some of the puzzled uh, looks when you tell this story. And he says, you have to remember, you were only looking at the planes that made it back to the base. You don't have any idea of what happened to the planes that were shot down. So presumably, the places that you don't see any damage, that's telling you that if you suffer damage there, the plane is going down. It's unrecoverable. It's going to crash. So, I mean, the reason I'm telling this story is he actually, you know, although he did not obviously single-handedly win the war, um, he single-handedly is credited with developing this field of what we call operational statistics, meaning that before you just start throwing numbers around and before you just start evaluating data, you have to think of what the question you're trying to answer actually is. And sometimes the most obvious data, the most obvious outcome to look at isn't actually the one that tells you the whole story. So just like the most obvious thing to look at here is where is the red I should reinforce there, sometimes that's not the best way to proceed. So let's go come back to all of those numbers that I talked about and try to put it into perspective. So technique survival. Now, now this is something that's talked about in every paper that talks about assisted uh, peritoneal dialysis. And a lot of them have come up with uh, a conclusion that says, well, we put in place an assisted peritoneal dialysis program, but we weren't able to show any improved uh, technique survival, so we're not sure if this is really a viable program. 
And, and this is actually something that was a criticism of our pilot as well. As we, if you remember that data, um, the actual our PD assist group had a lower technique survival for the first few months than even the PD eligible group. So this is often looked at as a, as a criticism, but when you take a step back and think about it, um, our goal never actually would be to increase the technique survival of this population. Remember, we're specifically selecting who we think are our frailest po uh, patients who are most at risk of failing independent PD. Our goal is not to turn these into well, thriving peritoneal dialysis patients. Our goal is to support these frail people and keep them independent at home. So frankly, having a technique survival that's equivalent to our, our baseline or our, our, our general cycler population is a fantastic outcome. It shows that we were able to keep these patients at home. And a similar thing when we talk about deaths, you know, when, when you look at those numbers, you'd say, well, we had nine out of 53 patients over the course of one year passed away on this. Uh, you know, if you were trialing a drug or something, it would have been pulled within two months of the trial for safety concerns. Um, but again, we, we're not going to make these patients live longer. They are frail patients with many comorbidities. And in fact, I would argue that this highlights one of the key benefits of a program such as this. All of these patients, were able to stay on PD right up until either they decided to discontinue or until they passed away, which is fantastic. Because when you think about it from a, you know, a patient-centered uh, uh, way, the absolute last thing you wanna do as someone's in kind of, you know, nearing the end of their life is have them have a modality change. In other words, say, you know, you're failing, things aren't going well, you're going to switch over to hemodialysis, and then they pass away anyways a month or two later. What a disruption to their life. I think a real benefit of a program such as this would be to allow for that end of life planning to happen, keep them in the home environment, and then eventually start you know, transitioning your, your direction of care. So to me, the fact that they stayed on PD at home right up until they passed away is, is another good outcome. And then lastly, hospitalization. You know, everyone says, oh my goodness, there was increased hospitalizations. I, again, think about what we're trying to analyze here. It's not that the PD, at least I hope, it's not that the PD assist would have uh, caused hospitalizations, you know, it's not like the caregivers were, were doing, you know, uh, causing something, and we know it wasn't from peritonitis because they had lower rates. Um, so everyone says, well, you know, there's increased hospitalization, but that might actually be a, another positive thing about this. Um, and we, they've seen this in other trials that probably what was happening is just having a caregiver go in the home every day they probably picked up on some acute, uh, you know, things that were happening and then directed it uh, to attention. And, and anecdotally, that's what our PD units all told us during this, this um, uh, pro, uh, pilot is that the caregivers would often be calling the PD unit saying, hey, did you know what's going on with, with Mr. Smith? Like, I think there's a real problem here. Like, he probably has to get checked out. And so it probably actually represents recognition of problems, uh, you know, on the ground, which probably is a good thing. It's not that they were sent to the hospital for, you know, uh, for trivial reasons. It was somebody walking in the room and saying, oh, geez, you need to get to the hospital. So when you contextualize it that way, I think these are all positive things, but you can see some of the difficulties you have in evaluating a project like this. And now, um, you know, we'll move on to, of course, there's costs. I said this is a common theme with every uh, PD Assist uh, program is there's going to be an added cost to it. So, you know, you don't need to look at this table. I just took that out of the evaluation to prove that I didn't just make up numbers. But um, when we average it out for a year of assisted PD, the way we've provided it with once daily visits, it's about $15,000 on top of the pre-existing dialysis costs. And again, this is something that you need to contextualize. A lot of those previous reports of assisted PD programs have said, yeah, we've, we felt that it worked pretty well, but there was this increased cost and we couldn't find a way to make it cost effective. And everyone's comparing it to self-care PD, trying to think of avoiding hemodialysis transfers or saving this and that. And it's not really the right way to, to, to put these costs into perspective. That kind of you know, manipulation and massaging of numbers, that's the type of thing that lets people convince themselves that a budget deficit is gonna be $10 billion as opposed to $30 billion. Um, you know, you shouldn't really play fast and loose with numbers like that. Um, really what you need to think about is what is the cost compared to the available alternatives? Because again, it does, we're not comparing them to well PD patients because they're not well PD patients. If you've already identified that someone is failing PD or you think might fail PD, what are the uh, options available? And traditionally, those have been long-term care if they're fortunate enough to get to a facility that can do peritoneal dialysis. 
or transition to hemodialysis. There is no zero cost option here for someone who's failing peritoneal dialysis and wants to carry on. So our goal should be how do we provide the best care to that patient at a cost that's acceptable. So looking at those options, again, we can put up a similar figure. So the, the one on the left is, um, oh, sorry, that should say PD, uh, with PDA, it's my, my apologies, but that red bar is the $15,000 cost of PD assist tacked on top of regular PD. The one beside that with the green bar shows the additional cost of doing PD in a long-term care facility. And the one on the far right is hemodialysis. And I'm sure the one on the far right is a gross underestimate because it doesn't include things like access and hospitalization around the time of, of transition. But again, when you put it in this lens, now you see that uh, assist, uh, assisted PD is actually a very uh, um, uh, financially viable option. Um, and to put into perspective on a provincial level, uh, during this pilot, we kind of sent out a needs assessment. And, and our estimates based on that is that somewhere between six and a half to just under 8% of BCPD patients are, are viewed by their PD units as being good candidates for that. And when you extrapolate these numbers, it, it really runs around the half a million to $600,000 range, which is just a, it's a small drop in the bucket when you talk about our overall dialysis um, uh, budget. Now, Earlier I said, well, you shouldn't really be thinking about this in terms of am I saving costs compared to self-care PD. But then I said, well, one of the ways that we, we, we're going to save money is it costs less than a transition to hemodialysis or less than a uh, transition to long-term care. And that's a very difficult outcome to evaluate because it's hard to prove something that didn't happen. It's hard to say you, tr you avoided transfers to hemodialysis that didn't actually occur. So the, the way that I, I tried to contextualize this is, is through a bit of a sensitivity analysis and say, well, you know, we feel that we're pretty good at picking out who we think is going to fail peritoneal dialysis and offering the support just to those people. So what it, let's take a look at a few different uh, scenarios. So what you see at the bottom on the, in the red uh, bar there is if we're right 25% of the time about that. In the middle, you see two lines that directly overlap almost. There's the PD assist cost and there's the cost if we're right about a third of the time. And then uh, at the, uh, on the top there in uh, purple, that's the cost of 45% of our patients transferred to hemodialysis. So the break-even point here is if we're right about a third of the time in selecting a patient, this is going to result in a net cost savings or a cost minimization. One in three, not bad. I think we, you know, we can hopefully should be able to, to, to pull that off with all of our expertise in the units. And that's definitely what uh, uh, you know, we would have seen through this pilot. So putting it all together um, in just the last couple minutes here, so I, I think you know, between what we've heard earlier today and between this presentation, hopefully I've, I've convinced you that this is a patient-centered way, way to support someone on an independent modality. Uh, our eventual hope is this may even translate to increased prevalence, although that was beyond the scope of this evaluation. Um, the cost of these programs are less than the available alternatives, and because of that, it's quite scalable. Um, and so lastly, in the last couple minutes, um, I'll say the next step. So, you know, after this evaluation, we have the full support of, of everyone here in BC. That includes both the renal agency and our funding body, the PHSA. Um, and as of the last couple of weeks, we've gotten some more updates, so I can actually start, start saying a little bit more. So I can say there definitely will be a provincial PD assist program moving forward. Right now, we're in the process of just uh, examining what that's going to look like, putting it out to public tender because it's going to be a provincial pro uh, project, but there will be uh, a program. It will be very closely based on this pilot, similar level of support, and then from there, it may build, build up to other things. Um, but, you know, I think over the next couple of months, we'll start seeing some updates about this. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Bevel Dr. Bevilacqua. Um, is there any questions? Just a quick question to turn on. Um, first of all, thank you for telling me to get on the, when I go home, to get on the plane with all the red dots. Because yeah. <laughs> that's the one I'm going to take. Um, <laughs> My question to you is, do you have any comparative data with HD assisted, uh, home, home HD assisted? No, uh, you know, that's something that people have uh, talked about quite a lot. And, you know, I, I think at that point, it's such a different comparator group that, you know, I didn't really look into that. And I, I think that would be kind of very, very much uh, apples and oranges. I know what you mean, dialysis houses, things like that, you know, kind of the Australian model. Um, but I, I think the level and the types of support that we're talking about are, are, are so different that um, 
you know, I, I wouldn't want to compare it to our PD population, but I know whenever those are programs are evaluated as well, because that's another interest of mine, they run into exactly the same pro uh, uh, problems. People saying, well, this, do this costs more, and you're not showing quite better outcomes. But again, I, I, think, it's, I think it's the wrong question that's being uh, uh, phrased to those people. Do you have any idea on the cost of those? Um, not off the top of my head, I don't recall. I'd, I'd have to look in, I'd have to double check. It's more, and you know, other programs uh, compared to ours are definitely more, depending on the level of support that, they, that you offer. Uh, it all really comes down to the number of visits you're doing, and with those assisted hemodialysis, one of the problems is, is those are RNs, as opposed to our just, um, you know, caregivers, so automatically the, the fees that they're charging are higher. So it's definitely more than what we're talking about here. So that was sort of a loaded question because PD, another plug for PD, you can do this with PD without a lot of equipment, a lot of cost. For hemo, it would be prohibitive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is definitely more. Thank you. Okay, this is a very interesting project, and I think uh, timely because our population is aging, and we have come to a sort of a twilight area when a patient is elderly and wants to be comfortable in her home or surrounding like that. And if they are continuing a treatment uh, and had a sudden fall, as you have said, <coughs> that creates a temporary problem and we can bring them out. But my question is, in your vision, are you proposing that for this type of patient, they stay at their home, or for the temporary thing, you have to take a lease from a, another building or somewhere the caregiver can go? You know, uh, so through this, this project, I, I think what we're proposing is to try to keep these people in home. And I think the, I'd even go a step further, is any time one of these types of episodes happens, it's a good time to really evaluate the care of that patient. And I think that's what something like th this project allows us to do. So when someone falls and has a fracture or something like that, if we're able to keep them doing their dialysis and bring them in and start having conversations about, you know, how are things going in general? Do we need to start thinking about different uh, directions of care? That's a conversation that's a lot better to have when a patient's still at home and supported, as opposed to when they've crashed into hospital and we're now putting a line into them and putting them on hemodialysis. I think this actually does give us a forum to support that patient while we're able to talk about where, where their overall direction of care is going. Okay. I have, <clears throat> I see this type of patients and I see another problem. From the patient perspective point of view, the second one that you had in the first slide, 88 years old, and you have some questions about the cognitive aspect of it. And some of my patients, they live in a nursing home as, or assisted living, mm -hmm. and they don't want to go to dialysis. But what happens when in Easter holiday and other time, the relatives comes from outside, say from States or uh, England, they say, no, 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 mom, you should continue. So there is, it, there is the difficulty that if this patient gets an asthma attack the next morning and goes to the hospital, the relatives will say, see, I said you, she should not be at that place. So uh, how do you proceed? Do you allow somebody to do a, a cognitive assessment of the patient and follow that direction? or you follow the emotional directions from uh, other relatives? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that's a bigger uh, picture question that obviously we run into it with a lot of patients who we're doing life-sustaining therapy on is, you know, are, do we reach a time where we're continuing versus discontinuing? I, I, I think, you know, that's probably a bigger picture item here. I think the, the, the nice thing about a project like this is at least we can support the patient and we can keep them uh, you know, in their proper environment while we start having those conversations. That's always a conversation that's easier to have if the patient is supported uh, and in, you know, at home rather than once they've crashed into to hospital and people are already doing all kinds of things. It's going to be tough no matter how we slice it, but I think this actually might be a tool to help support the environment to have those conversations. 